how do we move from a presence like this? The presence of the Lord is so heavy. It's hard to even speak.
rising of the sun to the setting of the sand. He will be exalted among the nations. And everybody will know that Jesus Christ is Lord. you would visit us, that you would be with us today, Lord. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to dive into your word, Lord, to fellowship with each other. And Lord, I just ask that you would, that we just invite the Holy Spirit, Lord, have your way, guide us, teach us, shape us, make us, mold us into what you would have us to be, Lord. Help me to decrease so that you can increase, Lord God. I ask that your word would have free course in our hearts free course in this room. Lord, I ask that you would guard our hearts and our minds from corruption and error, that you would guard our hearts and our minds from anything that's not of you, from you, by you, or for you. Lord, I just ask that you would, uh, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord God. I ask that you would use your word to edify us, to build us up, to sharpen us, to bring the transformation that's needed, that we could let our light shine so bright that the world sees it's you and it's undeniable. Lord, we just ask that you would continue the work that you started for we know you are faithful to bring it to completion. Lord, I thank you for the gift of teaching. I thank you for the gift of preaching. I thank you for the anointing that's upon me, Lord God, to preach the gospel, to minister your word uh, in season and out of season, Lord God, uh, rightly dividing the word of truth. Lord, I just ask that you would have your way in me. In Jesus' name, yes, amen. amen, amen. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <sighs> Hallelujah. Well, family, this is week two of a, uh, 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 this is the second week of a new month, of a new year. It's 2022. Can you, can, can, that is amazing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And with that being said, we're going to continue to have a new sermon series every month. And for the, uh, our theme for the month of Genesis, or uh, for the month of January, is Genesis. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, the word Genesis is an English translation of a Hebrew word, Bereshit, which means in the beginning. Genesis, as we all should know by now, is the first book of the Bible. It is the first of the five books written by Moses, known as the Torah. Um, the book of Genesis explains the origins of God's creation, time, space, and matter, the heavens and the earth, mankind and the animals. It tells us how God originally designed things to be and how it was perverted and corrupted. It tells us the history and the fall of man and God's intervention and plan for redemption. Hallelujah. Um, uh, it's the, uh, the first prophecies and promises concerning the Messiah or in the book of Genesis. Uh, God's relationship and dealings with Adam and Eve and Abel and Cain and Noah and his family, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph and his brothers and everyone in between. All leading up to the Exodus when the Lord sent Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of bondage from under the oppressive hand of the evil Egyptian Pharaoh. There is so much we can learn from the book of Genesis. 50 chapters worth. We can study it for a year and barely scratch the surface of all that God wants to teach us through it. With that being said, it was hard for me to choose from all of that. But I believe the Lord led me right to what he wants me to cover for the day. Last Sunday evening, a brother asked me a series of questions concerning Cain and Abel. And that sent me on a deeper dive and a closer examination of Genesis chapter 4. So that's where we're going to be this morning. Uh, we're going to do, uh, we're going to take this chapter and do an expository breakdown known as exegesis, which is a critical analysis and explanation or interpretation of the scripture to discover its intended meaning and or purpose. So check this out. Um, most people, not just Christians, uh, but people in general, especially in America, have, uh, have heard of the story of a man named Cain who killed his brother Abel. Uh, but most people haven't taken the time to read it for themselves, let alone to carefully consider why. God gave us the Bible in the history, in the stories in the Bible, not, not just so that we can read it, to say that we read it. He wants us to use the reasonable and rational mind that he gave us to conscientiously examine the details of what's laid before us. The word tells us in Proverbs 4, 7, wisdom is the principal thing, the chief thing. The most important thing, okay? Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all you're getting, get understanding. See, the devil told Adam and Eve in more or less words that knowledge, uh, uh, that knowledge would make you like God. And still to this day, the world teaches that knowledge is power echoing the half-truth that the God of this world told the innocent and ignorant couple in the garden. But God teaches us that true understanding and wisdom are far superior and come by direct revelation from God. Hallelujah. The fact of the matter is you can have all the knowledge in the world and still know no better. Think of all the geniuses Think of all the scientists. Think of all the, 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 the people who are searching.
searching outer space trying to find God and not realizing that he's right next to them and the Christian that, that's been preaching the gospel to them and, and living the life of Christ. They're looking so far and the word says that is God not, is God a, a God afar off? Is he not near you? See what the devil didn't tell Adam and Eve was that you can know what God knows but without the Spirit of God, you won't do what God does. You can know what God knows, but without the Spirit of God, you won't do what God does. Now, now that we've been exposed to the knowledge of good and evil, we can't just be blissfully ignorant anymore. It's dangerous to just be blissfully ignorant. God doesn't want you to just know that something happened. He wants us to understand why it happened so that we can learn from it. He wants to teach us. He wants us to learn from the successes and the failures of those around us. Uh, our brothers and sisters, the people around us, the people of the past. He wants us to learn from their failures and their successes. That's why he left the Bible here for us to learn what happened in their lives, not just to read words on the paper. He really wants us to, to dig deep and consider what's going on here. You know, and as we learn from the failures and successes of others, uh, it, it brought me, uh, it made me think about Proverbs 21, 11, uh, which says, when a scorner is punished, the simple is made wise. And when the wise is instructed, he receives knowledge. Okay? And what's that saying? That's saying that it's, it's crazy because when somebody is disciplined in front of us, okay, even the most simple person will say, I don't want that. I don't wanna, I don't wanna go through what he just went through. And I don't wanna do what he just did. It, it teaches us a lesson when we see what happens to the rebellious person, to the disobedient person, to the scorner, to the mocker, to the one that, that, that blows God off in his commands and his instructions. That's actually for their benefit. God's commands and instructions are not arbitrary, but they're built upon his wisdom and his knowledge, his understanding, grace, and his care for us. It also says that when the wise is instructed, he receives knowledge. Why? Because he listens, he pays attention, and he takes it in. He receives the wisdom that's given humbly. That, that brings me to a point that when we read the scripture, we got to ask why? Why? And there's two types of whys. There's an arrogant and rebellious why, and there's a humble and curious why. I liken it to two different children, right? You've got the one that you tell your son or your child, hey, do this, and it's like, man, why I got to do that? That's disobedient. That's arrogant. He doesn't want to know why. He just wants to fight back. Then you have another child that you say, hey, can you do this for me? Hey, dad, why do we do that? Now that's a humble why. He's seeking understanding. He wants to know why so that probably, so that he can better apply the knowledge or the wisdom that's given to him. He's not fighting against you. He wants to understand. So God has no problem with us asking why. God has no problem explaining to us why. If we're humble enough to ask with the right heart. See, a lot of things with God is not, it's not necessarily about what's being done, but it's about how it's being done. Somebody said the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Two people can do the exact same thing, and one is received, and one is rejected. And we're gonna see that as we break down this uh, passage. But I tell you this uh, before I get started, a humble why 
is better than a careless what? A humble why is better than a careless what? What does that mean? It means that a person that comes and, and humbly asks and, and seeks understanding uh, uh, is better than a person that just knows what's going on and doesn't really care. You can tell them and they just, they don't care. It's not necessarily about what that God's trying to show us, but it's why. So we're going to go ahead and read Genesis, uh, read uh, chapter 4 of Genesis, verse 1 through 16, and we're going to go back and break it down from top to bottom. In other words, we're going to put our detective hats on, and we're going to investigate a murder. Hallelujah. We're going to investigate a murder so that we can see what we can learn from it. See, I've always liked, uh, you know, especially BC, I used to like uh, things like CSI, uh, you know, the crime scene investigation shows and, and, and different detective shows because, I, I don't know, I, I've always had a heart of a detective. I've always wanted to dig deeper and find out what's going on. I, I can never just take things at face value. I really wanted to make sense of things. Uh, and and um, I've been lied to a lot in my life. You know, so I wanted to examine the study to show myself approved. I really wanted to make sure uh, that things line up because, uh, man, people lie. People lie like crazy. Uh, and a lot of people don't even know they're lying. You know, uh, so, so it's up to you to not just take everything at face value, but to study to show yourself approved, to examine. Uh, and, and, and God wants you to read the scriptures and to study and, and even, you know, dig into apologetics and stuff like that to find out if he's lying. You know, uh, the word says that you can do nothing against the truth, only for the truth. You're never going to disprove the truth. God's never scared of you proving him wrong. God's never scared of you uh, 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 exposing him. Everything's laid out for you, okay? You dig deeper. The word says, seek and you shall find. He says, you shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. God's not scared of you figuring out something about him, okay? He's, he's, he cares. He wants you to care enough to dig deeper to know him better. So, we're going to go ahead and, and read Genesis uh, chapter 4, 1 through 16. And then we're going to go ahead and go back and break it down. Hallelujah. It says, verse 1, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and, and she conceived and bore Cain, and, Cain or, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bore his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in, proce in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground in offering to the Lord. And Abel, he also brought the firstling of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto, Abel's, and, and, unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you wroth, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, uh, sin lies at the door. And Unto you shall be his desire, and you shall rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother and slew him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And are you now, and, and now you are cursed from the earth, uh, which has opened her mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you, when you till the ground, it shall not from here forward yield unto you her strength. A fugitive and a, vag uh, a, va a vagabond uh, shall you be in the earth. 
And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me out from this day, uh, out this day from the face of the earth, and from your face I sh uh, shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vag uh, vagabond uh, in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that finds me shall slay me. And the Lord said to him, vengeance uh, sh uh, shall be taken on him sevenfold. Uh, and the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him uh, should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of God on the east of Eden. Hallelujah. So let's break it down from the top to the bottom, um, because this is this is there's there's a lot that God wants us to see in what's going on here. So first and foremost, we got to understand what, what happened before. We understand that Adam and Eve were put in the garden, they were deceived, they fell, they sinned, uh, and, and God, they, 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 they were exposed to the knowledge of, of uh, the, the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, God issued out the, the curses that was uh, upon Adam and Eve and, and the generations to come and the serpent, he prophesied the coming Messiah, uh, and he cast them out of the garden. He cast them out of the garden, and he uh, he put cherubim and a, and a flaming sword to keep them from going back. So now they're outside of this place that was specifically made for them to dwell in the presence of the Lord, where they're not exposed to the evils of the world. But now they're starting a new life where where they're starting to learn and and and, and experience things that they had never experienced, things that God never wanted them to experience. So Adam and Eve, or Adam knew his wife, they come together and they conceive, they have a baby, and their firstborn son is Cain. And she understands that Cain was given to her from God. And then she bears another child, and this is their second son, this is Abel. Okay, and Abel, it says, he was a keeper of the sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. All right, God wants us to see something here. All right, Abel, Cain was a worker. He worked, okay? Now, now Abel was a worker too, but he understood that he was a steward, okay? He understood that what he had, God gave him, and he was keeping, he was taking care of what he knew to be God's. But Cain was working hard, okay, and, 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 and stressing and being frustrated and, and being bothered by what he's doing. You can tell just by his character that it didn't seem like a blessing to him, the work that he had. Do you know that work is a blessing? Work is not something that you should be angry about, but it's a gift from God. Okay, but he had a different mindset. You can imagine that he was stressed out and frustrated, back broken, going through all this drama when he's working. But, but Abel had a different experience because what he was doing, he was doing as unto the Lord as a steward. So it says in the process of time, it, uh, it came to pass that they brought an offering to the Lord. Now this wasn't law. All right, this wasn't, nobody told them this is what they had to do. This was far before the law, okay? And so they bring an offering to the Lord. And Cain's offering was of the fruit of the ground. All right, so we know that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, okay? It doesn't really specify, but we're just considering, okay, that uh, um, what, a, what Cain offered God was already, it, it doesn't seem like he had to work for it or think about it or, or give any effort to what he gave. He could have just grabbed some things off the ground that naturally fall off of a tree uh, 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 and would have rotted anyways and just handed it to God. Okay, but it says Abel brought the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof, okay? Uh, he gave his best and he gave his first. In the book of Malachi, it tells us that God rebuked the people because they were giving the lame and the sick and the weak and the diseased and the broken. They were given, the, they were given God the scraps and the things that they're not going to miss anyways, the things that doesn't really matter. Uh, and, and, and we got to be careful when we give our offering 
belongs to God. Because once again, the heart of the matter is the, uh, is the matter of the heart. We can both be giving, but, but we look at the, uh, the woman that gave the two mites, okay? She gave everything that she had. She gave her best. She gave her most. She gave her last. And the Pharisees and all the rich men that were giving uh, uh, abundance, they, 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 they gave what they wouldn't miss. They gave what didn't really matter to them. And Jesus said that that blessed him. He was pleased with what she did more than what they did. We got to be careful that when we give to God, we're giving him our first. We're giving him our best. We're giving him uh, uh, joyfully, cheerfully, excited, uh, and, and, and blessed and honored to be able to give to him. Right. And not begrudgingly, not, not angry that we have to give. First of all, you don't have to give nothing. You don't have to do nothing. You can rebel and run around and do what you want to do. God don't, you don't got to do anything. If you choose to do it, praise God and do it right. And do it with all your heart. Okay, give your best in any situation. That's what Abel did. He gave his first and he gave his best. And it says that the Lord had respect to Abel's offering, meaning he accepted it. Praise God. He accepted his offering and he accepted Abel. Amen. Hallelujah. He says, but in verse 5, it says, but to Cain and to his offering, he did not have respect, meaning he did not accept it. He didn't want it. And it says, Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you wroth, or why are you angry? Why do you have such rage in your heart that I rejected your offering? And why is your countenance fallen? Okay, and I, and I tell you that not only, okay, so, so God wasn't asking Cain this question because God didn't know. God was asking Cain this question because God wanted Cain to think about why? Why are you angry? Why were you smiling when you came and brought it, but you, your, your, your face twisted up when I said no? That's good. And I want to take two things to consideration. Number one, uh, uh, we got to be careful not to come to God, giving our offerings, expecting things from God. The word says give hoping for nothing in return. You know what I'm saying? We don't give to get. We give because we've been blessed abundantly, more than we could have asked or thought. God has provided for us and blessed us in ways we never even thought to ask. So when we give, we're not giving to God to twist his arm and say, Lord, you better give me back more. You better give me back double. You better, no, no that's not why we give. Okay? And, and it's dangerous because so many times people come in with that mindset, well, I've been giving to God and I've been serving and I've been doing this and he ain't blessed me and God ain't good and God ain't faithful and all this stuff. That's not the right heart. How dare you be angry with God because he didn't give you back. You know what I'm saying? Because you, you, you do manipulation. You twisted scripture and tried to make it something that it's not. Come on. He says give freely. Yeah. Give cheerfully. Give joyfully. But I say this also. Not just things that you give to God. But your time. Okay? Your service. You know and we're going to get we're going to get into this place uh, as we move forward because uh, verse 7 says if you do well yeah. shall you not be accepted come on. come on and he says if you do not do well sin is at the door sin is at the door unto you shall be his desire and you shall rule over him it's saying that sin is about to have its way in your life depending on the direction that you choose depending on your response to what's happening right now 
I, I asked you to carefully consider your next move. Carefully consider why you're feeling the way you're feeling. Why your face is all twisted up right now. I really want you to examine what's going on because your next move could be your worst move or it could be your best move. So what does he mean if you do well? If you would humble yourself. See, see, Cain had this mindset of entitlement. He felt like he deserved for his offering to be, to be received, to, to be accepted. What makes him better than me? What makes his offering better than me? Matter of fact, I'm the firstborn. And you gonna take his over mine? I've been here longer. I've been doing more. I'm sweating every day. This dude's just walking around smiling and happy. What could he be going through? He looks happy. He ain't stressed like me. He ain't bothered like me. He ain't going through it. This mindset of entitlement. Oh, he's blessed. And we got to be careful because this mindset happens in the church. This mindset happens all the time in the world, right? You both came in at the same time, all right? And, and, and a period of time has passed and this man becomes a pastor. This man because, gets keys. This man uh, 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 gets an opportunity to preach. It seems like he's moving up faster and you're angry at him for it. See, the word says, you younger, humble yourselves under your elders. In due season, he will exalt you. See, God determines who gets moved up and when and how. He knows the depths of the heart of man. And, and what's crazy is that God exposed the heart of the man because when what he wanted didn't happen, he turned on God. When what he wanted didn't happen... His face turned on God. And his face turned on his brother. And in, in verse 8, it says, And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to, pass, or came to pass when they were in the field. And Cain rose up against him, his brother Abel, and killed him. You can imagine what this conversation was like when they're in the field, right? All right, after this offering situation, his gets accepted, his gets rejected. They're walking around. You can imagine that, that Abel is full of joy. I mean, the joy of the Lord was upon him. He's celebrating. He's rejoicing. He's excited. He's blessed. He's walking around just full of the joy of the Lord. And Cain's over there just mad, just angry. It is doomed. I'm over here working, he's sitting here whistling and skipping, feeling good about himself because God loves him, because God blessed him and all this stuff. I'm telling you there's some stank faces in the church. You want to walk around happy and filled with the joy of the Lord and they hate it. The Pharisees were the same way. The Sadducees were the same way. They couldn't stand Jesus. And the joy that was upon him, the word that he had to share, the good news, all they're doing is spewing venom and bad news because they haven't experienced, they're going through this religious process. So many people are just going through a religious process. They haven't had an experience for the Lord. They're sitting here working their backs off. They're not serving joyfully. They're not blessed to be able to serve God. It's an honor to be in the house of the Lord. Whether that be standing at the pulpit or washing toilets or everywhere in between, Lord, use me as you see fit. I'm thankful to do anything for God. Anything. Amen. And the word says that he that humbles himself will be exalted. But he who exalts himself will be humbled. 
You can consider that in verse 8, uh, um, when he's, he's going through this process in his head, and he's, he's, he's angry at his brother because he's rejoicing and all these things, and he starts plotting and planning to kill him. And I don't know if it was like premeditated or if it was just instantaneous, man, shut up, and he smacked him in the head with a rock or something. I don't know how it happened. It doesn't specify, but we do know he killed him. And we could imagine that he killed him with the mindset that if I take him out the way, he's no longer my competition. See, once Abel's out the way, then God will bless me. Once Abel's out the way, God will be happy with me again because this do-gooder, you know what I'm saying? This, 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 this one that, that, that's showing me up ain't gonna be here no more. So he has this mindset that I'm gonna take him out. The word says that in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves, proud boasters, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unholy, unthankful. They'll have this mindset. But one of the things that, that, that it says is that they, it says despisers of those that are good. They can't stand to see someone uh, uh, doing good in the, in the Lord, really growing all, oh, he's faking, he's, there's something, there's something, uh, something, something to him. He's not really who he acts like and stuff like that. That's for God to determine. That's for God to determine. And if you see him moving up, if you see him exalted, leave that to God. Leave that to God, but don't, please, don't hate. You know, it sounds cheesy. Don't hate, congratulate. Do that. Simple as that. Hey, man, good for you, man. Praise God that I, I just see your progress. I see your growth. I see, you know, what God's doing in you, and I celebrate that. I pray the best for you. I pray that the Lord continues to use you in amazing ways. I pray and keep praying for them. Keep praising God for them. But don't ever envy them. Don't ever hate them. Don't ever be angry at them. Because one thing is you don't know what they've gone through to get to where they're at right now. See, you may not have seen the mountains that they had to climb. You may not have seen the storms that they've been through. You may not have seen what they had to go through to get to where they're at right now. And God is blessing them for where they've been in the faithfulness. Okay, God has already tried them. God has already tested them. And he is determined that they are fit for the place that he has got them. Don't take it upon yourself to feel some type of way. But you be faithful. You do what's right. You trust God. And in due season, he'll put you where you need to be. And if you're thankful, because the word says godliness with contentment is great gain. All right? Are you content just being in a relationship with God? Lord, you don't got to put me nowhere. You don't got to do nothing. I just want to be with you. I just love you. Anything else is extra. And I know that whatever get you give me, you got to take away eventually. So I don't want to hold on too tight to that. But I'm going to hold on to you. And those are the type of people that God moves for. But it reminded me of a, uh, in, in Matthew 21, it reminded me of a parable that Jesus gave. Um, in Matthew 21, 33 and following, it says, hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to the husbandmen and went, and, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen uh, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. And again, he sent other servants more than the first and they did, uh, they did unto them, them likewise. 
But the last of all, he sent to him to them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and they cast him out of the vineyard and they slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those husbandmen? And they said to him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out his vineyard uh, unto other husbandmen, which shall render to him the fruits in their seasons. And that really, that really made me think about uh, 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 Cain and Abel's situation, right? Uh, and how he had considered, you know, we can, we can think that he considered, uh, if I take him out, then I can have his inheritance. I can have this spot. And that's what the, that's what the Jews did. That's what Israel did, right? They were the firstborn. They were the ones that everything was given to. And then here comes this Jesus, the, the, the Messiah on the scene. And they, they realized, they knew it was him. They knew that he was coming to take what's his. And they conspired in their mind, let's kill him. Because if we kill him, then he can't take what's his. We can have it. That didn't work out too good. Because what the devil meant for evil, God worked out for good. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So after this happens with, with Cain, and, and Cain and Abel, you know, verse 9 says, And the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel? your brother. Once again, God wasn't asking him where is Abel because God didn't know where is Abel. God wanted Cain to consider what he had done. Not only to consider what he had done, but to acknowledge what he had done. The response that he should have had is, Lord, I got angry and I killed him. Lord, I messed up. I don't, I don't know what happened. I lost control. I did this. I did this. I, I killed him. He's, he's dead. But instead of humble repentance, his response was, I don't know. I know not. So first of all, he lies. He knows what happened to Abel. He says, I don't know. And then he responds in arrogance and says, am I my brother's keeper? Oh, is that my business? What happened to my brother? Think about that. The arrogance of how he responded to God. To number one, lie to him. And to number one, put this, this show of pride. And then God says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. It's amazing nobody had to tell God. The word says that the rocks will cry out as a testimony against you. The things that you've done. You never know what God, what, what, what God sees through. The word says that the eyes of the, the, the Lord are everywhere. Seeing good and evil in every good and evil place he sees it all. You don't need a snitch. Okay, you don't need nobody to tattletale. God sees what happened. And the best thing you can do is confess to it. Humbly admit what you've done. Go to the Lord truthfully. And in the same way uh, 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 that, that his father, uh, Cain's father, uh, did in the garden, you know what I'm saying, where, where he said, you know, the woman you gave me, rather than taking accountability for what he did, okay, he blamed everybody else. Cain, he just lied about it. He just lied about it and, and was prideful saying, you know, what's that to me? Who, who is he to me? Who is my brother? I'm not my brother's keeper. But like I said, the word tells us that his blood cried out. And we're gonna get, we're gonna go back to that, you know, as, as, uh, as I wrap it up. But after this takes place, God pronounced a curse upon him. In verse 11, it says, and now you are cursed from the earth. 
which has opened her mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall from here forward not yield her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be in the earth, okay? Think about this, right? He says, when you move forward, you're not gonna be blessed. The things that you do, you're never gonna get ahead in life. You're gonna be skeptical of everybody. You're gonna be watching your back. You're gonna be scared of everybody because you're gonna think that what you did to them, to him, they're gonna do to you. As a matter of fact, he goes on and he says, Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Yes. I can't bear this kind of weight. <laughs> they say, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime, right? You know what I'm saying? Everybody's remorseful. You know, that's what the word talks about. Uh, 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 a worldly repentance versus a godly repentance, right? A godly repentance is, is when you're convicted and you're sorry whether you got caught or not. You're able to tell God, you're able to confess these things before anybody knows it, right? But, but everybody confesses the things uh, once they're caught. You're caught red-handed and you're like, yeah, I guess, you know, yeah, I did that. You're not sorry. The fact of the matter is you're trying to get out of the consequences. You're trying to get out of the consequences for what you did. You're not sorry for what you did. You're sorry because you're about to have to deal with what you did. Cain was sorry because of the consequences that was coming. He wasn't sorry because of what he did to his brother. It goes on to say, behold, you have driven me from this day uh, uh, from the face of the earth and from your face I shall be hid in a, a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. Shall, uh, it shall come to pass that everyone that finds me shall slay me. You can imagine this, this life of guilt and shame and fear where you can't get comfortable anywhere you're always on the run always on the move and feeling like everybody's out to get you and the fact of the matter is he knows he deserves it he knows he deserves it there's something crazy about uh paranoia right you're usually only paranoid when you're doing something wrong and if you get caught it's because you deserve it if, if, if these repercussions come against you, it's because you deserve it. I'll tell you what, when I was lost in the world, I used to drive around with, with, with weed or, and, and drugs and stuff in my car that shouldn't be. And every time a cop got behind me, I was scared to death. I was scared to death. I was scared to death because I knew I was doing what was wrong. And I knew that the, the word says that the authorities are not a terror to those that do good, but to those that do evil. He says you should be scared. You should be afraid. But I tell you what, now, now that glory to God, I'm legit, everything's good, I get pulled over, I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm not scared of the police, I'm not worried about what they're going to do to me, because everything checks out, everything's legit, I'm covered, and I'm, I'm walking with the Lord, you know, and the word says not a bird falls from the sky without our Father's consent, so I'm cool, I'm at peace, unless I'm speeding. <laughs> and if I'm speeding, I'll take it on the chin. But you better believe I'm going to pray, Lord, have mercy on me. I know I shouldn't have been doing that. I'm not even going to make excuses. I make too many excuses. I, I messed up. If you will, have mercy on me. But if I got to pay this ticket, so be it. That's what I deserve. Okay, and sometimes he'll have mercy and let you go, and sometimes you won't pay that ticket. Okay, because you won't learn a lesson. You know what I'm saying? And the word says that, that uh, the Lord disciplines the ones that he loves, and those that are trained by will yield peaceable fruit of righteousness. So sometimes it's actually a blessing for you to get that ticket so you can learn to ease up on that gas pedal. I haven't learned that yet, but I'm in a process. All right, by the grace 
of God will get this under control. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. So verse 15, it says, And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whosoever slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Notice that God didn't permit man to kill him. Okay? He's, he, he's saying, yes, you're wicked. Yes, you're evil. Yes, you did what you did. Yes, you deserve this, but I'm not permitting another man to do it to you. As a matter of fact, if another man takes it in his own hands to kill you, sevenfold the judgment is going to be upon him. I've set a mark on you. And that mark is a, is a protection. So it says that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Notice this, up until this point, he was still walking in the presence of the Lord. Even when Adam and Eve got cast out of Eden, the Lord was still with them. The Lord was still with him up to this point. You can see the back and forth. You can see the relationship. You can see the dealings that, that he had with him. But from this point, he went out from the presence of the Lord into the land of God. And then it goes on in the rest of the uh, passage or the rest of the chapter to explain uh, uh, the genealogy of Cain and the people that were to follow. But I do, I do want to make this one point that, that, uh, that Lamech, who, who uh, came from Cain, okay, it says Cain had Enoch and uh, uh, Enoch had Irad and Irad had Mahujael and Mahujael had Methusael and Methusael had Lamech. Okay, and Lamech took to himself two wives. Okay, God never permitted him to have two wives. Okay, God never instructed him to have two wives. This is something that he did outside of the presence and the relationship with the Lord. This is something he conspired to do on his own. Okay, and he says to his two wives after you know he goes through his children that he had, and he, he confesses to his wives that he murdered a man. That he killed a man. But he says that I killed a man for hurting me. Now we don't know if this is in, in, in vengeance or in self-defense, okay? We know the law tells us that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is just. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, but Jesus said, I say greater. Okay, I say love your enemies. It, you would be just getting an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Okay, but I say forgive them, love them, bless them, okay? But this man was, was within justice. If this is, you know, what he's saying, that this man uh, 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 wounded me, he assaulted me, and I defended myself or even got vengeance in whatever sense, okay? He confesses to slay the man. So you see murder, or at least killing, you know, going through the, 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 the genealogy of, of Cain, okay? But, but he says, Lamech says, um, that if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, tr truly Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Okay, if, if Cain doing what's evil, God still is going to protect him. Me doing what is just, God is going to protect me that much more. I tell you what, Romans 12, 19 tells us, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. The word says, don't avenge yourselves. He's going to do the avenging. He's going to take it into his own hands and he's going to do it rightly. He's going to do it thoroughly. You don't got to worry about that. Just trust the Lord. Forgive. Let go. Understand that the debt has been paid. It's been paid in full for them and for you. With that being said, I want to I leave us with this. 
because uh, I could carry on so much more. I don't, I don't need to. I praise God. Listen, uh, me and me and my uh, wife and my kids, we do this daily uh, Bible study uh, in this devotional book, and 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 at the end of every. Uh, uh, scripture, every every chapter, it has like a, a thing called Christ connection, and he connects they to connect it back to Christ. You know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, all of this is pointing to Jesus. Okay, there is a full revelation and and and, and culmination and 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 redemption that happens in Christ. So all this is pointing to Him, and I want to hover on verse ten. Verse 10 told us, and he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. So what did Cain's, what did Abel's blood cry? It cried, avenge me. Avenge me. But the word tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and the sprinkling of the, uh, 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 the, the blood of sprinkling and the, uh, that speaks better things than that of Abel. Hallelujah. Right. Hallelujah. So what are those better things that, that, that the blood of Christ cries out uh, uh, versus what Abel's cry? Abel's cry, avenge me. Christ cried forgiveness, yeah. atonement, mm -hmm. redemption, salvation. I paid the debt. Forgive them. That's right. The word tells us that Jesus lived the life we should have lived, and he died the death we should have died. The word tells us that he was spit on, that he was mocked that he was beat, that he was crucified, that he was hung on a cross, that he died, and, or that he, while he was on that cross, he looked down and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the word tells us that he died on that cross, and that his side was pierced, and that he was took down, and he was buried in a tomb. But on the third day, he rose again, yes. defeating sin and death. And the word says that whosoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, he paid the debt for every murderer. He paid the debt for every liar. He paid the debt for every proud person, every arrogant person. He paid the debt for everyone. The lamb that was slain for the sins of the world, past, present, and future. And the word says that we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. He knew what Cain was going to do. He knew what all, every person was going to do. He knew what I was going to do. He knew what you were going to do. And he paid the price for it. Yes. And he paid it in full. Yes. You deserve death. You deserve damnation. But God in his grace is willing to offer to you what you don't deserve. Because he took what he didn't deserve upon himself. Family, if there's anybody here that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, I would love to introduce you to him. Today is the day of salvation. If there's anything that you haven't confessed to, anything that you haven't acknowledged, do that. Run to God boldly. Confess to him what you've done. If you've been hiding in pride, if you've been hiding in arrogance, don't let that be the case anymore. Confess it. Deal with it. Receive the forgiveness. And if you need prayer for anything else, anything at all, please come up. The altar is open. Amen. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Stephen Worley. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, comment, and subscribe. If you'd like to donate to this ministry, go to shilohub.org. Remember to hit the bell for notifications, and we'll see you next time.